News Radio 1000, KTOK, Gwen Falk and her Lippert here with you on this Sunday evening. Happy Father's Day, everyone. Do you know a great man? Are you the product of a great man? Well, here with me in studio tonight, there is a great man. His name is John J. Dwyer. He's an author and also a professor at Southern Nazarene University. You've probably heard him on with me many times because he has also written so many fabulous books one of which that I'm stuck on, The Oklahomans, The Story of Oklahoma and Its People. But he's also written other books, some fiction, some nonfiction. And uh, this is how tonight happened. Uh, We have an acquaintance in common, uh, Donna Copeland, and she went to his book signing and she came back and she said, Gwen, do you have anyone for Father's Day that'll be special? I said, you know, I really don't. She said, oh, then you need to have John J. Dwyer, author professor, journalist, former sportscaster, on with you to uh, talk about the significance of great men and fathers in life and in all of his books. John, how many books have you written uh, over the years? Well, Gwen, I've got uh, six in print, uh, two more on the way in the next year. And uh, that would total how many? That would be eight. Eight? Yes, Yes. ma'am. And people around the state of Oklahoma now know you because of the book I mentioned to the Oklahomans, but also you've got a new book out called Short Short Grass, Grass. and it is the story of? Well, Short Grass is uh, an Oklahoma story, uh, Gwen, and it is a story of Lance Roark, a good old Oklahoma farm boy growing up uh, in western Oklahoma, uh, down around the Duncan area where I actually grew up uh, during the Dust Bowl. And he's a Mennonite, so as you might imagine, there's some implicit uh, tension there. He's a pacifist, comes from a a church that's a little bit separatistic in their ways, very pious. But uh, the complication for Lance is that he is also a great natural athlete, which leads him to uh, college gridiron glory on what actually was historically the first great OU football team in the late 1930s. Uh, We put him on the team with Waddy Young, who was the great uh, first consensus All-American football player at OU and a great World War II uh, legend and hero in his own right. And then Lance also becomes uh, an aviator. Uh, And that gets more complicated when the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor and America finds itself knee-deep in World War II. And he's got this crisis of conscience. Everybody wants him to take command of a B-17 flying fortress. But he's got these lifelong convictions against uh, violence, and that's kind of the crux of the uh, drama as uh, Short Grass continues into the early, uh, y- the first year of World War II. And then there'll be a sequel, as I think you know, called Mustang that comes out early next year that's already written and is in the publisher's hands at this point. Well, I want to know more about fathers and the significance that fathers have played in the lives of the different people you've written about. But... Uh, when you tease this, the Father's Day story of a real Captain America, is that a totally different story? Well, that's uh, kind of the story, uh, Gwen, of, I guess, uh, my own father. Uh, some of the people that, uh, you know, have, have read my material are familiar with our website, which is uh, John J. Dwyer, John Middle Initial J, D W Y E R dot com, uh, where you can find information on all these books and many articles and so forth. But uh, there on Facebook, Twitter, and so forth, uh, I put out today a uh, an article that I actually wrote years ago. Uh, about a, a father, and it was actually, uh, for those that have read it, know that it was actually my father. And we we had kind of the teaser line, the a Father's Day story of a real Captain America. And I guess that came from uh, the reality. Those of you that are familiar with the great <laughs> Captain America story, I love those films. And they, of course, come from the, the classic comic strip that goes back to World War II, the 1940s. But Captain America, Steve Rogers, is initially kind of the quintessential 98-pound weakling who uh, tries to join up to do his part in World War II against tyranny. And he's so frail and so uh, has all these illnesses and They won't even let them in, even though they're desperate for manpower. Well, of course, that's the genesis of the Captain America story. Well, my own father, uh, 
while not frail and, you know, beset with maladies, he was legally blind in one eye, uh, legally deaf in one ear. So he goes to join up uh, as an 18-year-old recent uh, high school graduate from class in high school in Oklahoma City, and they won't let him in. They say, hey, you know, you're 4F. You can't come in in any regard. Well, uh, you know, he was... uh, uh, that was not to his liking. So he continued, like Steve Rogers, Captain America, trying to go back and reenlist, went back a number of times over a period of a year. And as the article talks about, he finally goes in one day and he's so desperate, he, he switches eyes during the uh, eye test and uses his good eye on both parts of the exam and manages to get his way into the U.S. Army and was over in the Pacific Theater, uh, went up, advanced to sergeant uh in the new guinea and other campaigns for three years in world war ii so he's and he paid quite a price he he got malaria he lost all of his hair while in the pacific he had a thick full head of curly blonde hair in all of his pictures before the war he comes back he bald as a cue ball he got strafed on a new guinea airstrip by japanese zeros uh, and he lived a very short life, um, passed away when I was and my brother were infants. But the fact that he did what it took to get in and do what he considered was his part uh, when they thought, you know, you're not worthy, you're not fit, uh, he'll always be my Captain America. So that's my father. What a marvelous article. What a marvelous uh, story. Now, how were you told this story? By your mom? You know, uh, Gwen, it really kind of came from a variety of sources. You know, my mom had very limited information because I know you've interviewed uh, World War II veterans on here on your show before and, and the sons and daughters of them. And those guys, uh, they didn't talk about their experiences for a long time. And those that, that didn't live to be real old, uh, never had a chance to talk. I, I remember when the great film Saving Private Ryan came out uh, around 1998. It seemed like that kind of started a, a shift in these older heroes. Uh, by then, they were up in their 70s, early 80s. Most of them, they, they began to feel like, hey, I could talk about this, and they never had before. So my mom told me that uh, the most our dad ever told her before he passed away at age 35, uh, she would ask him about the war. He'd say, well, you know, yeah, there was a lot to it, and someday I'll tell you all about it. And uh, the only thing that she remembers him telling her was that two times he got advanced to sergeant, and both times he got busted back to private for fist fighting. So <laughs> I guess that's the O'Dwyer Irish in him. <laughs> But uh, some of it came from her very little. Some of it came from letters that he wrote to his own father, which we have those letters all during the war. And, of course, they're they're priceless treasures, so we can glean some. For instance, he's writing in one of those letters to his, his father. Then there's a break, and he comes back, doesn't say anything about it. But his father told my mom later that that was when they got strafed by these Japanese zeros and he had to run for cover. Didn't even mention it in the letter what was happening. No, he didn't want to make your mother crazy, I guess, or or whoever he was writing to. So I I asked that question because in your writing, you do look at fathers and sons and relationships and the impact that uh, men have on uh, families and others. And I was wondering, did did your own Captain America influence you looking for these relationships? Well, Gwen, I'm sure a lot of people listening right now can relate. A lot of folks, you know, we, we hear, you know, hey, it's Father's Day. Let's be thankful for the great fathers we had and all. Well, the reality is a lot of us either didn't have great fathers or we didn't have any fathers at all or we had absent fathers, especially that World War II generation to get back to them for a second, uh, you know, they did not have all the uh, benefits that now are available to veterans, uh, you know, the rehabilitation, the counseling, and the understanding that these guys went through t- horrific stress and, and traumatic syndromes. And so they they shouldered that burden on their own. They didn't talk about it. And I say that because a lot of a lot of Baby boomers grew up with fathers that seemed distant, uh, seemed to have a hard time with their their feelings, being able to communicate. Well, in my study over these many years, which much of my writing 
being historically involved has had to do with men that were involved in war, quite frankly, and some of them career, some of them uh, because they were called upon in a time of their country's need. And so I've learned that uh, a lot of these guys that were distant, that didn't talk to their children, you know, Reba McIntyre, great Oklahoma singer, has that classic song, The Greatest Man I Never Knew. Mm -hmm. And who was that man over the newspaper that I never really knew, that I loved, I wanted to know better? Well, a lot of these guys, uh, they didn't make it all the way home. Even though their bodies did, they lost friends uh, over there. They didn't come all the way home. So uh, that has been a theme for me as I've gotten to know these guys. And uh, through my writing, especially my novels, my first novel, Stonewall, about Stonewall Jackson, we can maybe talk about that in a minute, but uh, classic story of a, of a lifelong search for order, but also for a father. Uh, was really the genesis of this great quest that Stonewall Jackson went on in his life that led him into uh, uh, immortality in history. I think this is a popular theme, and I mean respectfully a popular theme. I've noticed there are more films doing this and, and that, and I've, I so your timing is impeccable on this. But how how long ago did you write Stonewall? Stowell came out, Gwen, in 1998. It was my, my first published book. Uh, it's, you know, uh, um, I don't know what this says about me as a writer, but my first efforts probably sold more copies than all the other books I've written combined. I mean, that book's been repeatedly, uh, you know, repeated editions in the last nearly 20 years. It it really, uh, I think, uh, caught a... Uh, you know, uh, uh, caught a note with people in a lot of different ways. But I think for Stonewall Jackson, this was a person that we think of as a, a famous military commander. A lot of people think getting mixed up with Andrew Jackson, the mm -hmm. president, who was also a, a military commander earlier in his life. But Stonewall Jackson, very few people know that he lost his mother, his father, his brother, and his sister all in various incidents early in life. So he had this ceaseless quest for order in life, for certainty, and a big part of that was for a father, which led to him in that quest to finding a heavenly father since he never had an earthly father except for a few years early in life. And so through his uh, conquering of others, he found a heavenly father? Well, I think what happened was this search for order. I'll tell you what. I'm going to have to interrupt right this second. I got involved and wasn't paying attention. We need to take a break. You're listening to 1000 KTOK. My guest is John J. Dwyer. He is an author and historian. We're going to talk about fathers and their lives this evening on 1000 KTOK. News Radio 1000 KTOK, 74 degrees in Oklahoma City. Gwen Falk and her Lippert here. Happy Father's Day to all of you. Special treat tonight, John J. Dwyer is here with me in studio, and he is an author and historian, a professor, and uh, he has written eight books and uh, understands the importance of relationships and fathers to their families and to uh, their role in leading our country. Uh, when we had to go to break, uh, John, you and I were talking about Stonewall Jackson and his search for order. And uh, the fact that he found a heavenly father when he couldn't find his own. Right, Gwen. And by the way, all these books we're talking about, if folks are interested in them, they can they can get these at the Barnes & Noble stores at Oklahoma City area, Full Circle Books, uh, Amazon. We've got an author page there. And, of course, my uh, my website, John, middle initial, J, Dwyer.com. We've got all sorts of information on all of them. But Stonewall Jackson, you know, he's remembered as a great military uh, hero and actually in two wars, you know, he, he got got his reputation actually in the Mexican-American War. Uh, he was one of the most uh, decorated and promoted uh, officers in the American Army uh, in the war against Mexico in the mid-1840s, long before he got the the unforgettable sobriquet of Stonewall when, when one of the other generals were watching his stand on the field at Bull Run or First Manassas and said, there stands Jackson like a stone wall rally around the Virginians' men. And so he's remembered as this this audacious military commander uh but 
to me, what drew me to his story was the personal story of this little boy. He was actually an orphan, Gwen, uh, in his early years because his father had died, his sister died, his brother died, and his mother died. And even though this was his mother and not his father that said this, here's a here here's a a, a reminder for us that are parents or even mentors, aunts, uncles of the of the permanent uh, impact we can have on young people's lives. His mother was on her deathbed when when Stonewall Jackson, Tom J- little Tom Jackson, was six years old. All the family was gathered around her, saying their goodbyes. And right before she died, she called Tom Jackson, little Tom, to her, called him out of the group, singled him out, and said, "You." Tom Jackson, remember this, you may be whatever you resolve to be. You may be whatever you resolve to be. She told this six-year-old boy that in the presence of numerous family uh, witnesses. He never forgot those words. And that just built, like etched into him like granite rock to never quit, to never give up, to be determined to pursue to the end anything he put his hand to. So, as he did that, but he, this search for order, for certainty, uh, this little orphan uh, for fatherhood, eventually he found it that he could only find it in a heavenly father. That brought his life together. It ordered it. It gave him purpose. It pulled his talents together. And uh, he's remembered Yao as, a, as a, a great war leader, but for those of us that are Christians, at least, we would consider much more important in providential history how he led this great revival, this great religious revival in the southern armies during that war in which tens of thousands of lonely, homesick, heartsick, oftentimes physically sick boys and men away from home uh, put away their sin and came to Christ in a very unusual place, uh, the camps of war. And how were you able to find that? I mean, was that in written accounts from different uh, soldiers to their parents or something? Or? Yeah, it's remarkable, Gwen. Both Stonewall Jackson and then, uh, as you know, Robert E. Lee, that's the sequel to that book that picks up uh, right before Gettysburg in the midpoint of the Civil War and moves forward with the focus on Robert E. Lee. Both those men, uh, they kept copious personal d- journals, personal diaries. So a lot of the material comes from their own writing. But there were also uh, other officers, friends, their wives, um, uh, chaplains, and many very literate people around them that that recorded uh, observations of their lives as they went. So those two men, Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee, there was an abundance of material to draw from uh, eyewitness accounts of their lives. And how much research did you have to do to write these two books? Well, let's just say, uh, I know Stonewall Jackson took me seven years to write, or the book Stonewall about Stonewall Jackson. Robert E. Lee probably took four or five years, but I had a lot of the research done through the work on on the Stonewall book. But I think, you know, whether I'm writing uh, nonfiction like uh, the Oklahomans book or my Civil War textbook, The War Between the States, America's Uncivil War, or these historical novels, uh, I I am a bear cat for authenticity. I don't want anything to lose credibility because somebody says, well, that's good drama or that's that's a nice literary flair, but it's really not true the way he wrote it. So I, I probably am, am obsessive about factuality in my writing. And I'm sure you have found that truth is really more incredible than fiction can be. Absolutely. All of these stories, whether it's Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, uh, the fictional account with my new historical novel, Short Grass, about the Oklahoma farm boy, Lance Roark, and World War II aviator, uh, all of these stories, uh, the, the strangest and most unbelievable parts about them are the parts that are absolutely true. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. I'm talking to John J. Dwyer. You can find out more about him at johnjdwyer.com. We're going to pause for an update. News Radio 1000 K. KTOK, Gwen Falconer, Lippert, happy Father's Day to you. Here with me in studio, John J. Dwyer, author, professor, and uh, historian. He is here with me this evening to talk about his different books, and we've been uh, talking about the different ways that uh, fatherhood seems to be one of the uh, common threads through his different uh, nonfiction novels. But uh, he has a new modern-day novel, When the Blue Bonnets Come, and it's a little bit different perspective, isn't it? 
It is, Gwen, and it's interesting here on your on KTLK, the local uh, radio break. There, uh, uh, you you heard probably a. a spot that had a former great All-American OU football player, Gabe Eichert, from uh, Oklahoma City McGinnis High School years ago. And uh, I happen to know uh, a little bit more about him because my daughter, Katie, uh, went to college with him, was in the athletic dorms for a year there, and, and always spoke highly of him. And, and I think of him, uh, I think it's propitious he was on that spot because, you know, it's Father's Day, and part of the theme of this talk is about fatherhood, and it occurs to me that little boys and little girls are going to find fatherly influences. It might be a dad in the home who's being faithful to them and to their mother. Uh, if it's not that, it's going to be something else. Uh, th- there's going to be a void that somebody or something is going to fill, whether that's a, a gang or whatever. Uh, I know in my own life, my father, as we talked about at the begin, uh, beginning, passed away when I was an, an infant. My brother was as well. And my mom was a, a widow, and she was always concerned about what were going to be the male influences in our life. So, you know, she found things like John Wayne. You know, she thought, well, let's get, you know, get these boys to watch John Wayne movies, uh, get them in sports where they've got coaches. And, and so, uh, you know, we had a, a lot of influences like that. And one of the other influences for me, honestly, was OU football. I can remember from age as young as four and five years of age, listening to OU football games on the radio, probably on KTOK and on Saturday afternoons and going out and acting those games out and being those players in my front yard and in the neighborhood and stuff. So I say that because a couple of my books now have featured as heroes OU football players. And one of those is uh, people like hopefully Gabe Eichert, uh, not only a great athlete, but a great young man. And when the Blue Bonnets come, is the story uh, actually of a woman, an adult woman, looking back on her youth and at, at her father, who was a former OU football uh, player of, of some renown, who had become a small-town pastor. And as a little girl, she watched him stand up to very strong and sinister commercial forces that were coming into their little town. And you and I were talking about it. it's kind of strange how uh, you know fatherhood uh, as a, as an author part of my job is to see the world to see reality through the eyes of different people and in this case uh, Gwen I saw it through the eyes of my daughter Katie as she was growing up as a little girl I, I saw so much more of life looking at it through her eyes and hence this book when the blue bonnets come is told really through her eyes as an adult looking back and uh, I'm just going to read this one passage it's one minute long to give you a feel for uh, a little girl looking back on her life and remembering her father and I say this because as fathers we need to realize they are watching us men uh, wherever you're at you might be in the home things might be great you might be apart from the home you might be in any given situation but today's the day to step up make sure you're doing the things you should be doing for your children if you're not uh, start doing them get back even if it takes a while to get back to doing that through relationships and so forth so here, here's this passage uh, Katie Shanahan looking back uh, on her girlhood, remembering her daddy. I remember Annie Lee, who was her horse. I remember Annie Lee nickering as my daddy put the bridle over her head. When I watched him swing high up into that saddle in his jeans that always smelled of the land he loved, even when Mama just washed him, and his boots that looked the same the whole time I knew him, which wasn't long enough. I remember him smiling that white smile that always made me feel safe, even though I knew it was not all smile behind his blue eyes. It could turn hard and final as the twisters that came over from Tornado Alley. Then he had my little white hands in his rough big one, rough shore for a preacher, and I was flying up to that saddle myself, and the butterflies were fluttering in my tummy, And somewhere, a little girl was giggling with a delight she had no reason to think would never be quite as full or free again. And when I make it to the upper sanctuary, one of the first things I'm going to ask God is why he only let me figure out so many things later when I could have used them earlier. That's very poignant. Well, I think it's, uh, you know, we don't realize the uh, voices that sometimes are voiceless through these little people. 
And some of the folks listening out there today, you might not even be the father of that young person that you know needs help. It might be a kid that you know needs mentoring, coaching um, in some way. That that fatherly influence is going to be filled by somebody or someone. And what I've tried to do, and I don't necessarily even think I knew it when I set my hand to it almost 20 years ago. Now, over 20 years ago, I started writing Stonewall. But it was to tell the story of the search for fatherhood as one who myself, you know, I searched for many years for a father that I could not find. And and kind of like Stonewall Jackson, uh, I found it ultimately only in my heavenly father. I I couldn't find it in an earthly father who was gone. actually had another one that came along that was a bad man, who was not a good father. But I found it in an earthly father. And, you know, the Bible promises that uh, this great words of comfort for any that are listening that uh, may be missing their father, may have never had a father, may have felt like they wish they had a different one the the biblical promise that that god himself it will be a father to the fatherless in the last couple of minutes that we have here talking about your books and thing and uh your public appearances you've become very popular and you're traveling the state you're talking about your books but what do you feel is your overall message when you make these public appearances well, Gwen, I think part of it uh, right now, you've talked about the book, The Oklahomans, this uh, it, this Oklahoma history book uh, that I wrote. And that, you asked how long these books take. That book took over 10 years to write. That's uh, volume one of two volumes of the, the history of Oklahoma. It goes up ancient history through statehood. Uh, former Governor Frank Keating wrote the foreword, uh, which is a wonderful little mini history of Oklahoma in itself. But uh, volume two, which will go, come up to the press. We hope to have out Statehood Day of next year, 2018. And and so right now, a lot of these, these talks and these visits about the Oklahomans is to help us as Oklahomans realize what an epic, proud heritage we have. Who knew? Uh, if you're like me, I know you grew up in Ardmore, I grew up in Duncan, a lot of us listening grew up in these other places, and we had these ignominious little Oklahoma history classes that we don't remember anything from. They were so dull, they were so boring. Maybe we memorized the, quote, five civilized tribes or the names of the counties, but we have an epic uh, thunderous history in Oklahoma. And that's part of my message right now. I want us to realize we have a, a, uh, history that is good, bad, and ugly. As you know, you've read the book. We don't sugarcoat where we get off track, where we're off track, whether it's on race issues, whether it's, uh, issues with the, the, uh, tribes or whatever it might be, but, uh, a proud history that our children, uh, can stand on the shoulders of the people that have come before them. And I think what what I enjoy about this book, I like just picking it up and looking at the different parts because you can look, take it in parts or you can read sweeping passages or whatever, uh, is it's real, you know, to know the good sides and the bad sides of all these things. John J. Dwyer, I thank you so much uh, for making time to come up here on Father's Day.